Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We're here today to talk about newcomer issues, a little bit about you know why people are migrating in different parts of the world, and some of the things that our school is doing and things that are going on in our community. I'm really excited to be here with everybody today. Uh, I'll do brief introductions now, and then I'll do a little bit more formal introductions later. I'm going to be the moderator today. My name is Hilary Weaver. I've been here at UB School of Social Work since 1993. And um, I teach on refugee and immigrant issues as well as other issues of cultural diversity. The panelists that we have here today, we have Professor Sue Green, we have Dr. Uksu Kim, and we have Dr. Philomena Critelli. I think I should probably say a little bit about the words that we're going to be using today. I tend to use the word newcomer as an umbrella term that covers um, immigrants, refugees, um, people seeking asylum. It doesn't really speak to the immigration status, but it speaks to somebody migrating from somewhere else. More common terms that you would hear would be like immigrant, somebody who is typically thought to move for economic opportunities, has come from somewhere else, has official status in the United States. A refugee is a common term and that has an international definition of somebody who is fleeing based on persecution or well-founded fear of persecution. And again, those are people that get status before they come to the United States and come here as refugees. We also have a lot of people coming to our Buffalo and Western New York region who don't necessarily have the status yet, but they're seeking status. They're seeking asylum in the United States or asylum in Canada, which they call refugee status. So the terms get a little bit confusing. And I think since we're approaching this topic from different perspectives, I tend to use that umbrella term of newcomer to encompass people of varying legal statuses. In the last few years, quite a few of us at UB School of Social Work have um, done work in the area of newcomers, whether it's immigrants, refugees, you know, people from various statuses. In addition to the panelists that we have here today, I'll mention uh, Martika Bakayao, a new faculty person who does work with immigrant youth. Isak Kim, who does a lot of work on um, immigrants and racial issues. And Yanju Nam, who does more policy sorts of issues for immigrants, particularly elderly immigrants. I think we're getting so many people looking at newcomer issues at the school because of our recent shift to um, a trauma-informed and human rights curriculum. And perhaps in some ways we shifted that to that curriculum because of our interests. So I, I think it's mutually reinforcing. At our school, I think what makes us is distinctive is that we really look at all services and try to do things that improve their ability to be trauma-informed because so many people come from backgrounds where they would have experienced trauma. In fact, I, I believe it's at some point in our lives, most people have experienced trauma. That's particularly true of newcomers who um, might be fleeing their country for traumatic reasons, might have experienced um, significant difficulties in transit, again, creating trauma and also the trauma of resettling here because this country is not always welcoming to newcomers. So I think there are multiple layers of trauma. And certainly the human rights perspective that we have in the school also brings attention to the issues of newcomers. So I think we're well positioned to talk about these issues. The panelists all approach these issues very differently. We all work with different populations and a different take on these issues, but I think that ultimately gives us a fuller perspective. We are not attempting to be all things to all people. We're not going to cover every aspect of the migrant experience. But yet, I think the work that we do 
we'll touch on some very different perspectives that are helpful for our audience. So I'm going to introduce our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce um, Uksu Kim, who is Associate Professor at UB School of Social Work. She studies the well-being of Asians and Asian immigrants. Her research focuses on how Asian immigrants and descendants develop or change their behaviors in response to the socio-cultural environments of the host society that they migrate to. Her research appears in a wide range of interdisciplinary journals, such as the Journal of Applied Gerontology, Journal of Gambling Studies, American Journal of Alcohol and Drug Abuse, and Substance Use and Misuse, as well as social work journals. Currently, she's developing a research plan that investigates gambling and drinking behaviors among Asian immigrant elders in New York City. So welcome to Dr. Kim. I would also like to introduce Philomena Critelli. She's an associate professor at UB School of Social Work. She studies the impact of policies on the well-being of vulnerable groups, especially women and immigrants, in national and international contexts. Her research has focused on gender-based violence in Pakistan, with articles that have been published in journals such as Violence Against Women, Journal of Comparative Family Studies, and Critical Sociology. She's currently conducting a study of access to domestic violence services for refugee women in Buffalo. And our final panelist is Professor Sue Green. She is currently a clinical associate professor at the School of Social Work, University of Buffalo. That's the State University of New York. Susan teaches or has taught courses in social work interventions with children, adults, families, groups, and communities, trauma theory and treatment, trauma and human rights, risk and resilience, and diversity. She is committed to integration of theory with practice as she combines full-time teaching with clinical practice. She is the co-director of the Institute on Trauma and Trauma-Informed Care within the Buffalo Center for Social Research at the School of Social Work. Susan works and volunteers with various community agencies and projects in the Western New York community. Susan is certi certified as an EMDR therapist, is certified in advanced critical incident stress management, and trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. So welcome. For our beginning question, I think a lot of people wonder why people move in the world. So I'd ask us to reflect on what is going on in the world that precipitates migration. I think all of the panelists can speak to this, but I'd like to start with Uksu and her work on people who migrate for opportunities. Okay, uh, the very typical immigrants we have in our mind is the people who just moved in here, decide to come to the United States to find better opportunities for education, for jobs. So typical story we have is that when I landed this country, I had $50 in my pocket. Now look at me, I have a million dollars. I established a business here. Or people moved here to, to give better opportunity for their children. Sometimes it could be better education that they couldn't have it, uh, in their homeland. It is typical one. What I'm saying typical is there are a lot of atypical cases, maybe more than typical cases. One of them is like uh, the, the population I'm studying are the, the immigrant elderly population. They didn't come for success. They didn't come here to realize American dream. They came here, most of them came here because their, their children moved in here. So, is it really looking for opportunity? That's a question. So it, I think that the, the distinction between like a, immigrants looking for opportunities getting a little bit blurred. And one of my students um, currently, he, he wanted to study international students and their, their uh, success at the school. What he wanted to come, the, the thesis he has is that you know, some students came here, but not voluntarily. We think that all the international students came here because they wanted to. But uh, when he was looking at his own, you know, Korean international students, he happened to be Korean, and because of the strong family ties, they were forced to come here. Your parents say, go there and study. 
So it's this voluntariness and non-voluntariness is kind of getting blown even with this population who are supposed to be voluntarily moved to immigrate to this country. Okay, so even though we have a sense that immigrants come seeking a better life, there's a lot of variability within that as well. Right, a lot of family issues too, like uh, my husband decided to move so I had to come with him, or I got married to a man so that I had to come here, or there are, there are various reasons behind it. Some elderly immigrants, I just said that, you know, they came here because their family, because mm -hmm, their mm -hmm. children moved in here. I, I, didn't, I don't have anybody in my home country. This is like a what, where I should move because I want to be with my family. Some of them grew old here. Mm -hmm. So some of them came here, working for opportunity to stay here longer. So there are a lot of variations. I cannot say that typical immigrants or they're like a, if you look at like a immigrant elders, they are usually coming for their family, okay. not always. That's good for us to keep in mind. And Philomena, a lot of your work is around human rights, so I'm interested to hear your perspective of why people migrate. Yes, and I really would like to second what Uksu has just talked about in terms of some of the, the, the blurriness in terms of some of the categories of, uh, of newcomers. Um, many of our newcomers uh, in the United States are coming as a result of human rights violations around the world, and uh, refugees and asylees uh, fall into that, into that category. Um, and they are often coming because of just there's been a proliferation of global conflicts, of disasters, of uh, you know things that are going on in the world that have just kind of pushed people out of their countries to and, and uh, the United States is a major refugee resettlement area. Um, one of the statistics that I found is that there's seven percent. We really have a growing refugee population in the United States. Seven percent of our population are refugees, and Buffalo is really quickly becoming one of the top refugee resettlement um, areas. So there are people that are you know, fleeing, they're being pushed out of their countries because of war and, and even more recently um, because of the, 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 the global nature and the understanding of domestic violence and gender-based violence as a human rights violation, there is more an increase in uh, particularly women who are seeking asylum in the United States and other countries because of gender-based violence. This is something that's expanded in the last couple of years. Um, so we've seen, I've been actually asked to serve as an expert witness on some cases that, um, you know, where women have made a claim that they are being um, persecuted in this way. But um, apart from that, I mean, in terms of the, the other types of human rights violations, some people are, you know, they're, they're considered not really refugees, um, they are seeking economic opportunities, but they are actually pushed out of their countries. There's a lot of push and pull factors. They're pushed out of their countries because of, uh, you know, the lack of job opportunities, the lack of, you know, ability to really survive. And we're living in such a globalized world. There's, you know, just a number of pushes and pulls for people to try to come and, and find uh, jobs. And the idea is that people are supposed to really kind of move with the, the, the notion of globalization to move where jobs are rather than um, you know, necessarily creating jobs in some of those sending countries. So we're just seeing a whole you know, range of things that, that have people on the move globally. Okay, so a lot of global push and pull mm -hmm. factors. Sue, your trauma work has brought you to work with the refugees here in Buffalo. I wonder if that gives you a different perspective on why people move. So, as I'm listening to both of you, um, I, I most of my work is uh, working with uh, agencies or uh, even churches that are in the area that um, are, are working with families uh, that really need some level of assistance. So I, I tend to hear more stories of folks um, tapping into the hope factor. You know, there, there's a level of uh, belief that um, the fact that they are still on this planet and uh, surviving 
uh, they see opportunity in an emotional way. I, I don't know how else to put it. They, they, I, I have the opportunity to often interface with, with children. You know, the children of the, the mom and or mom and dad, or mom might be here, but dad somewhere else. Um, and so there's stories of um, where to keep focus. And, um, you know, Buffalo specifically has uh, really needed to uh, adapt their educational system to um, being available uh, for many of the children that are located here. And um, it's, it's really fascinating and inspiring to, um, to notice the amount of people that are trying to figure out ways, have it be in the child welfare system, to just the educational system, ways to connect with people um, so that we can understand better what it is that they might need and or to uh, tap into the hope with them. Um, to say the least, though, um, I would say that uh, we are more the learners than the teachers um, because there's just such a variety of language to uh, different uh, perspectives in terms of what makes most sense for each person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, so many newcomers are arriving in Buffalo. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we really need to be responsive to this population. All other aspects of Buffalo are shrinking in terms of our, our population, but the newcomer population is growing. Mm -hmm. And for our audience that isn't necessarily familiar with Buffalo, we're getting a lot of people now, they're coming from Iraq, they're mm -hmm. coming from Bhutan, they're coming from Burma. And in recent years, we had people coming from various African countries, especially Somalia, Sudan, in the 70s, we were having people coming from Central America. So we, we have a great variety of, of people here. I think it would be helpful to talk a little bit about our work that we are doing with these, these different populations. UB School of Social Work has found a need to, to be responsive to, to this change. As you were saying, agencies need to wake up. We need to be the learners. We need to know what the needs are. So I'd like us to refocus a little bit on what, how is UB School of Social Work responding to the needs of migrants and people facing human rights violations in their own countries? Now for this question, I'd like to start with Philomena and talk a little bit about your work in Pakistan, about honor crimes. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you doing in your work or perhaps other ways that UB School of Social Work is being responsive? Okay, well, thanks, Lori. Um, I guess I, I, I'm similar to Sue um, in that I came to this issue a lot from my practice experience, and I want to just give a little bit of background on that because um, I did a, a lot of work for actually 25 years in, in New York um, with, um, you know, in different service settings, particularly child welfare and domestic violence, and I was very struck by just the global nature of these problems. and. Uh, because of just you know the amount of immigration in the United States, there was a huge impact on service delivery. So I saw this in, in child welfare, where we had cases of uh, people coming into the child welfare system who had been refugees, who had gone through very extreme you know circumstances, and found themselves in the United States after having survived unbelievable uh, you know abuses and you know and war and conflict, finding themselves in the child welfare system or you know, women who were you know, coming to hospitals for, for domestic violence. So I really um, became very interested in how we could improve service delivery to, um, in our systems to, you know, to people who have been through those experiences. Um, after getting my PhD, I um, had just sort of a, a fortuitous experience visiting Pakistan and visiting a domestic violence shelter and some of the programs there, and it just struck me that it was a wonderful opportunity to be able to really go to the source, go to a you know sending country, a country where there are many you know many immigrants coming to the United States, and kind of understand things from that from that perspective. So I um, engaged in ethnographic several ethnographic research studies, um, interviewing survivors of domestic violence, um, talking to activists. 
um, looking at the services that they were providing. And I was very, very um, pleased and very interested to learn that they were using a human rights perspective. And that's one, I think, one way that, uh, you know, not all knowledge goes in one direction. I think that, it, you know, it was something that I think was very valuable for people here to learn about how other places were using human rights per perspectives. So um, I had another very, very interesting experience while I was conducting that research that just drove home to me the, the just the, the, the small world that we're living in and this interconnected world. Because while interviewing women who were at the shelter, I interviewed a young Canadian woman. She was not really living, her or place of origin was not far from Buffalo. She was visiting family in Pakistan and uh, fled because she was going to be forced into a marriage. She was 18 years old on the day that, that I interviewed her. And it just you know, drove home to me that this uh, research in Pakistan could be very valuable, um, not only in understanding a very major geopolitical you know, location in our world, but to help us back in the United States, to take this to a more transnational uh, kind of uh, perspective, to could help inform how we could better serve and, and have effective services for women from other countries in Buffalo. So, um, you know, after doing that research, I've now taken uh, my, my research uh, locally to look at um, some of the service barriers and access to services among uh, immigrant and refugee women in Buffalo. In the meantime, um, there was a very high profile case a couple, a couple years ago of, that was really actually misnomered as an honor killing. Uh, it was not. It was a you know high-profile case of a Pakistani woman that was murdered by her husband, and it, that again uh, drove home the point to me that it was very very important um, that service providers, because of the way that this, um, this it was very sensationalized and it was really kind of misunderstood among many of the service providers in Buffalo, and they really had to quickly, you know try to get their knowledge base up to, up, to, up to speed. So I'm working on a piece now that I, I think was very, very, you know, the, 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 the knowledge that I gained in Pakistan uh, researching this problem is, being, is very, very helpful in trying to frame this issue. I'm, I'm writing an article right now that can kind of help service providers, uh, school counselors, and people like that who are, com who are coming into contact with these issues. These are international human rights issues. They're being increasingly you know, recognized that way, and they're showing up all, you know, all over the world. And so it's very, very important that we adapt our approaches, our perspectives, and our ability to, to be able to effectively intervene in these circumstances. So I'm, I'm very excited about you know, the, the transnational, the, the full circle that, the, that this work has, has gone into. That is very exciting, and I really appreciate the connection that you make between the global and the local, because mm -hmm. it's all connected. Yes, yes. very exciting yes. work. Something that I'd like to, to make comment about uh, as a school of social work, I, I think one of the things that I've noticed is because of, for example, you, you know, your work, you know, we have our trauma and human rights course that um, all students take. So we take opportunity for inviting, example, yourself, right? You come mm -hmm. in and you lecture on these issues and put us in a position as instructors of that course then to really be in a spot of uh, having the discussion, let alone assignments, tied to the lecture material that you have shared with us over the last couple of years with all of our students. And I know for me personally, um, I've had several students then say, how do I get in touch with her? And so it, it's, it, it allows for the opportunity um, in a very different way than you know, reading it out of a book because mm -hmm. in person and or on tape, they, have, they, they know that if that's part of their own interest, have it be an MSW student or a PhD student, um, I see that as a major benefit in terms of our school that um, they, they, they can utilize and also assist with you, right? Um, because I, yes. I think I remember yes. that you also were in a position of being uh, taking one of our students with you yes. Um, yes. abroad. So that was, that was a very exciting experience. We did happen to have a Pakistani student among our student body, and uh, that was a wonderful, a wonderful experience and a learning experience for myself 
as well. But um, you know, you're t kind of talking about. It. I think the issue of immigrants and refugees really lends itself to looking at the intersection of the trauma-informed uh, care and human rights. I mean, I really think that the issues really do connect so um, so closely and so perfectly with you know that that population and. It's been um, you know, a very, I think, important perspective for trying to do research and, and, and look at some of the issues uh, among this population. So I'm glad I was able to help. All right, so you also do some international work. I know you're working up in Toronto with some Korean immigrants that are elderly. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that work. Okay. Um, actually, my study, my research is studied from my personal experience too. So um, I started to notice that was uh, uh, since I'm living in the United States, I noticed that in in the Korean culture, people are drinking. That's what I understand. Um, but um, and also in my practice experience, I have seen a couple of cases like a. Uh, very uh, severe alcohol problem. And the other one had, um, actually he was, he was diagnosed with depression. And until he got into, until he was hospitalized for his drinking problem, he didn't know he was depressed. So looking at all this, in my cultural understanding, and also look at uh, you know, actual cases there. When I looked up uh, research, prior research studies, I couldn't see any problems in this population. Not only Koreans, like the Asian population, do not have any problem mm -hmm. with drinking, any addictions. The, the studies I found do not corroborate with the, what I see in the actual life. So I think that's where I started uh, interested in uh, studying the alcohol issues, alcohol problems with the, this specific population. What I first realized is that probably there is, uh, they do not have a culturally sensitive measure. So when you ask, are you drinking, so some of the groups may not have, you know, perception of drinking is different from uh, when the, the perception, the, the definition they were using, the researchers are using to ask that questions. So I started that, that research uh, kind of plan going on. And when I first arrived in Buffalo, uh, amazingly, you know, we do not have that many uh, Asian population in th this area. And we're very close to Toronto. It's about two hours away by driving. Uh, the greater Toronto area, the southern part of Toronto area uh, could be like one and a half hours. So it was very doable to do the, uh, this research study with the population living in the Toronto area. So that's where I studied. And mm, I was interested in, um, I saw some opportunities uh, working with the, this Korean immigrant elders population. So I studied the same, same topic with this population. So what I found there is that uh, it was amazing because uh, at first I started with more problem focused. Okay, what kind of problem do they have, and why was it not captured in the you know uh, the the other studies? But as I study there uh, through focus group studies and uh, following survey studies, what I found is that for some of them there are benefits to drinking. They, it works, uh, since culturally, this is more acceptable behavior to make friends, to get socialized with others. This uh, possibly, and potentially, linguistically and socially isolated population use drinking to get to know each other. Mm -hmm. So there were some benefits to it. And also what I found was that uh, they, their perception or their understanding of drinking were not that much different from what they had in Korea. What they changed is their behavior because of availability of alcohol. They, only can, they can buy uh, alcoholic beverages in a certain place at a certain time. 
in Korea, it's everywhere. You, you can go everywhere. And, uh, grocery stores, you can buy it. And the other thing is that uh, they also, the price of alcohol kind of uh, dropped their use because it was too expensive for them. So what I found is that based on their social, social cultural environment, they adapt to the new environment by changing their behaviors, even though they didn't change their um, perceptions or the way of living, um, the way of using alcohol as a means to you know, get to know each other. So it was very interesting experience in that perspective. So your work really challenges some stereotypes that we have because we often assume elders wouldn't have a drinking problem. We also assume that Asians are problem free. Exactly. I think the uh, so-called model minority myth, it really hurts Asian, Asian population in this country or any other, you know, or the, like a Canadian country, Canadian uh, society too, because Asians, uh, in every article you write, you start with the significance of this study, right? Mm -hmm. And they say, Asian Americans become fast growing population with 5% of population. 5% is very minimal. And relatively, they're problem free compared to other minority groups. Either we do not capture the problem actually exist because of the, the small numbers, or because of the smaller portion of the problem they have, does not necessarily, necessarily mean that some of the, some of the, some segment of that population has suffered. Mm -hmm. that, that is all totally ignored in this setting using this model minority myth. And that's why I think uh, it is very important to look at their Know, sometimes problem behaviors and potentially problem mm -hmm. behaviors mm -hmm. to, to pay attention to, you know, so, to give a message to the society saying that, okay, there is a problem or we have, they need help. Some segment of this population need help. Mm -hmm. So your work helps all of us to have a deeper understanding of immigrants. I mean, I think it's really interesting because there's sometimes, you know, we have very stereotypic ideas about who, you know, who immigrants are or how old they are or, you know, what their needs are. And I think your research is really shedding light on the fact that this is a really very diverse, very diverse group of people across, you know, the lifespan. And so that, you know, we really have to think in a very nuanced way about, about the various groups and their needs. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think it's, it's very important because the elderly population, they are not really participating in any uh, economic activities. So uh, even though they, they have drinking problems, it's only about their quality of life. As a society, there is no big cost in this society. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why people just, okay, do we have to pay attention to them? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do, because we want to make sure that everybody leads a happy life in this country and well-being of their uh, life, well-being of uh, the Asian American elderly population is also important for us as a country. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the discrepancy between what we see and what we read in research studies, they are the things that I, I think it is very important to move on to the next level of my study. Mm -hmm. that as you introduced, the next study I'm, I'm planning to do is that um, gambling and drinking issues among Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we actually, I, I ran into um, one of the like a big uh, prominent researcher in gambling studies, and he and I had a conversation about Asian Americans and gambling issues. Mm -hmm. What is that is that if you walk in any casino, half of the population, half of the, the gamblers are like Asians, look like Asian at least. Oh. <laughs> but when you look at the national data set, not very, very little, very little portion of people gambling. He couldn't, he just said it, it cannot be true. 
So it was, I think, interesting um, to you know go further and explore and examine you know what was going on there. Very interesting. Now, Sue, your work is a bit different. You have been doing some very, very exciting things with Viva La Casa, which is, as far as I understand, the largest refugee shelter in the United States. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. Well, I want to thank you first for, uh, actually, Hillary is the person from our school who first uh, said hello to Vive and established a relationship with folks at Vive. Um, because as we know, um, trust is a, is a big deal in regards to any time other comes into, especially a home, um, it makes a difference in regards to how it is that we're perceived. So thank you for setting the, 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 um, the stage, if you will, several years ago. And so when we first approached Vive, um, as it goes in social work, um, it's about relationship. Uh, there was a person working at Vive um, who was a former student of ours uh, a few years back who uh, became the social worker at Vive about three or four years ago. So the long and short is I had her in class and um, we started the conversation and they, they uh, invited us as a school to also begin uh, field internships. So we've, uh, we have students placed at Vive La Casa and um, my work specifically wasn't based on any thought that I had. It was really a PhD student who asked um, whether or not a volunteer program that, that, uh, we're, uh, that I'm involved in is uh, the DREAM program with the School of Social Work, which is really an outreach community um, engagement uh, volunteer opportunity for students. It's student-led and um, students decide what agency or, or populations we might want to be working with that year. So the PhD student asked, is there a way that we could bring DREAM into Vive because of the uh, need that she saw, let alone her own interest. So that led to a um, burst of uh, enthusiasm, is the best way I could describe it, in regards to our students really um, I have found in the, the time that I've been doing DREAM program, uh, it is Vive that they really want to spend some time at. Um, the, the shelter is uh, it's a huge building that um, is 24-7, so it does not close uh, every day of the year. And, and as we could imagine, um, it's a transient population in the sense of people waiting to either um, get status in Canada or here. Um, but much has changed at Vive in the last couple of years based on uh, legislation. What used to be a two-week stay for uh, a person there um, now becomes a two-year stay, if not longer. And so the, the, the needs have changed in regards to what Vive um, is experiencing. So there's over 100 people that could be there at a time. Um, the, then that's a combination of men, women, and children. Um, from various uh, locations in the world, as you already indicated. So, um, Sister Beth, who was the student who was uh, with us several years back, uh, over the last year, would say, Sue, I, I just don't know what to do with, uh, especially the long timers that we have here, those that are post six months of being here, um, they, they, they are still um, suffering in many ways that, you know, they are not out of the crisis yet. They're out of the crisis of where they came from, but they're waiting and waiting for status or some kind of information. And uh, in her mind, they um, were being uh, put in a position or they are in a position of not knowing how to manage a lot of the distress symptoms. So um, long story short, um, and also with help of, of Hillary and Dr. Tom Lahowski, um, we, you know, as it goes as social workers, we decided let's let's try to figure out something. So, one of the, the most exciting thing that, that that I've seen is that uh, a couple of our students, uh, MSW students, have worked with me and, and Dr. Weaver around developing a curriculum of um, how do we do some present-focused trauma work at the same time knowing that there's a language barrier. And um, how do we at least pay witness to possibly someone's story 
in a way that we could also teach them something or provide them something that could help them cope. So we have run a couple of groups now at uh, Vive, one group with women and actually a second group with men uh, that, uh, you know, anecdotally, because we have not put it into an IRB process yet in the sense of uh, that will be our next step, um, we've, but it's a, an, an active uh, group time of uh, people learning how to manage some of their stress symptoms and the women and men both have reported out um, feeling better as a result of being part of the, the uh, support group that, that we've been involved in with them. And Sister Beth's been a part of that with us, so it's really run also by her, uh, so that she being the inside person from Viva. And there's much that I could talk about with that, um, but it, for me, um, students with me, but more so the students are in a position of being able to really hear the stories and um, hopefully dispel any of their own sense of bias or myth around what really is true about this person or that person um, by actively being involved either through the volunteer program of being there on Saturday evenings, working with the children and the women, or being a part of these groups or the internships that are there. Um, they are paying witness to people's lives in the, you know, the milieu, if you will, of their living environment, at least here. And um, it gives a tremendous opportunity in terms of uh, it being a connection of uh, how can we do this together. So um, I'll stop because I could go on and on and on. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting. And I think uh, for immigrants and refugees, all of them, newcomers, the basic and the primary and the biggest challenge is language. And you just mentioned that, mm -hmm. yeah, that is a, that is a challenge. Yep. And what is the kind of creative way you deal with that challenges? Because uh, if the language becomes barrier, it's, mm -hmm. good, it's very difficult to deliver effective For sure. you know, innovation. Mm -hmm. So there must be some kind of, um, you know, ways that you, you found it, it, it works. With this For sure. I mean, it's it's it, it varies. The plus is sometimes there's a person in the shelter that may have a command a, a little bit of command of the English language, so there's an automatic um, translator, if you will. Um, some of our students actually are um, equipped to to translate and or to speak in the language of folks that are at Vive. Um, so. We've uh, asked some of those students to be involved with us. Um, but the modality of, uh, you know, looking at you and smiling and using uh, body language, uh, uh, that simply in itself, we have found actually um, seems to uh, matter. Um, having Sister Beth be part of our activity because she's now familiar, right, the, the folks that live there, are, the children are familiar with her. So she is our, 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 our true anchor in many ways that, um, as you can imagine, trust, right? Trust is an issue. So the fact that Sister Beth trusts us coming in, it gives an opening more often than not to the person that, have it be the, the, the mom or the dad or the, the child that's at V Day. Um, we could probably, um, solicit most of our students, if not faculty, to volunteer some time to uh, provide, you know, ESL uh, tutoring. Uh, they, there's such a high need. You know, we have several agencies in Western New York, beyond just Vive, La Casa, that do provide services and um, outreach. But as Hillary mentioned earlier, um, the growing population that we have in this area, we, we don't have the match yet in regards to being able to fulfill. So it's, it's, they teach us how to communicate with them. And also, the bottom line is that with our, our, our group that we're doing, uh, we use Mandela art. Um, we're using actual um, ways of on paper as a way to express and, and folks being able to display their, their um, story in that way. Um, I really have to sort of support what Sue is saying about I mean communication and language are you know really very um, key issues in working 
with, uh, with this population and the practice level and on the, on the research level. And that was something that kind of troubled me when I went to Pakistan. I had to work through a translator. But um, it, I think what Sue says is absolutely right. The, using the social work, I found my social work skills were just very, very helpful in terms of eye contact, body language, you know, using nonverbal communication, even though I was working through a translator. And um, many of the, the feedback that I got was that many of the women were just very, um, they really enjoyed the process and they did feel like they kind of felt that they had connected uh, through that kind of uh, exchange. And they were just very, very happy. I mean, one of the things that is so, I think, um, I mean, I've been hearing this among you know all of us. Sometimes these voices are not being included in research. They're not being heard, you know, in you know in the service delivery systems. And so that we really need to be able to get those voices, uh, you know, in so that we can uh, you know better better understand. So the women in Pakistan were happy that somebody wanted to hear their experiences, and um, and I I'm sort of seeing that here now with the study that I'm doing. In Buffalo, although I have to say, from a research standpoint, it's really challenging because it takes a lot of time to get translators. Um, the, the population in Buffalo is so diverse and varied. We don't have massive groups of one, you know, of one particular ethnicity. And even within ethnic groups, there are variations in language. So just to be able to, you know, have people in the research studies, it takes, you know, money for for translators. It takes time to set it all up. And so I think a lot of researchers don't go in this direction. And, uh, but it's very, you know, it's very important to be able to, you know, take the time to, to do that. And to take so I want to echo, because, you know, from the practice world then too, mm -hmm. we certainly are finding ourselves in positions of not having the correct translator also mm -hmm. in, in, when in court, for example, yes, yes. or when making a decision on things. And so it is, um, Truly, I, I, I guess in some ways I might call it a, a crisis in some ways, um, that as a school of social work, um, I believe that we are, 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 are truly trying to pay attention to what, what could be our best response to this. So we appreciate from the practice world, researchers being interested in trying to um, really help us you know, move this in a direction that, that could be um, better serving. You know, what I gathered from what you guys saying was that the universal language is final language <laughs> and trust in our social work practice. That's, I think that's great information, great uh, message to the students, mm -hmm. social work students. Mm -hmm. This is it. Don't be afraid. You can go in and help. As you're all pointing out, there are a lot of challenges to this work. But I've noticed that we are using the word challenge rather than the word barrier. Because barrier feels like a wall, that you're stuck, that you can't do anything. But with challenges, whether it's language challenges or, or something else, you can try and rise to the occasion. It may be a struggle, but you're engaged in that struggle because you see the value in bearing witness to the story in doing the research, in reaching out to the people that have been ignored by research before. Social work is a profession of social justice. And when we're talking about newcomers, there are social justice issues involved. We cannot ignore these populations. They have a lot of service needs. They are part of our communities. We need to recognize that. And I'm proud to see our profession kind of stepping up to the struggle. And I'm very proud to see our school stepping up to the struggle. What we've talked about today is just the tip of the iceberg. Just a few projects that we happen to be doing. But I'm very impressed by the depth that we have at the school the depth of our commitment to various newcomer populations. We're seeing that reflected not just in our research and in our service, but we're seeing more of that in our curriculum. And it's not just us. I have to mention our students. Mm -hmm. 
because I think our students are our partners in this endeavor. We're seeing more students coming from these newcomer communities. And if they can take the best of social work knowledge with their grassroots knowledge and bring it back to their communities, that is the potential for change. And we are seeing other social work students not coming from newcomer communities, but who have that commitment, who have that awareness, who have that passion. And they are doing incredible work as well. So I'd, I'd like to offer an opportunity for, for closing comments, because we, I mean, we could talk for weeks on this stuff, but I think we've highlighted some important things. So as, as we wrap up today, are there other pieces that any of us would like to add about newcomers, whether it's our work, whether it's the school, or more general issues? I think you did such a beautiful job of really summing, summing up, I think, the, the current state of what's going on in our school. And I think, you know, the synergy that is um, kind of being generated between our focus of our, of our uh, you know, curriculum with human rights and trauma-informed care, the kind of students that it's drawing, the fact that we are drawing on a much more, I think, internationally focused and uh, diverse student population. It's, I think, coming together to really uh, produce some really exciting prospects for the future in terms of research and practice. I agree. And uh, at, on this side, we had a little conversation going on here, practice and we need research. Yeah. I think uh, that could happen, both could happen in this school of social work. So when you're interested in practice, you could come here and get exposed to the, this, this population with father language and uh, you know, the trust relationship and build uh, what, is the, what, it, what can be done with the, the social work practice. And also you can translate it into or move your, your uh, interest to the research if there are like a wealth of Know, of faculty members who are doing research in this field. So I can see that, you know, um, this is a great place to have both. The, the, the additional thing that came to my mind was um, also knowing that there are other uh, departments or schools within UB mm -hmm. that are also involved in doing the work. And um, it's given uh, me personally and I would say, you know, students the opportunity to interface with folks from uh, family medicine, from uh, the law school, from the business school. Uh, so, uh, you know, the overarching university, I think, is also um, an, an open opportunity for us all, too, in terms of partnering. And so I look forward to our uh, continued partnerships with uh, agencies, let alone with other uh, departments and or schools within the University of Buffalo. And I would echo Philomena's word, synergy, because I think that really describes what is happening. At this time, at this place, exciting things are going on in terms of newcomers, and I'm proud to be a part of it. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.